Hello and welcome to another episode of the Student Garden Thought Leader series. Um, today I'm super excited to be joined by Karen Gold. Karen, welcome. Thanks for having me, George. Um, Karen's the head of international student recruitment at Deakin University. Um, Karen, you know, looking at your um, your career and the experience that you've had, it looks like you've had, you know, obviously a number of years kind of working in the international student recruitment market. Um, I think it's very timely to be talking with you today, given the amount of change that's kind of happening around us um, at the moment, in particular within kind of the international student market here in Australia. But before we kind of get into that, um, we'd love to hear about, um, yeah, some of your highlights throughout your career and, and a little bit more about, I guess, um, you know, what um, a role like yours kind of entails and what sort of your day-to-day -day looks like. Of course. Um, I'm very fortunate to work in a wonderful industry and universities in particular are wonderful organisations. There's so many opportunities in different areas and I've really found my home in international I've been in international for about 25 years mm. and started off in international admissions. And I remember on my first day, I went into the office and I was given this huge pile of applications or, or offers and I had to check them and sign them. And I sat down, I thought, I have no idea of foreign <laughs> qualifications. What do I do? And there was nothing documented. So it was oh, wow. a real learning process all the way from there. And it was before international students really took off yeah. and admissions officers weren't really prepared for that onslaught of applications. We used to get applications, they'll paper and they'll be filed in filing I was just cabinets. thinking that. Was that yeah. via post or was that? Yeah, by yeah. post. Yeah. And we'd, have, we'd overfill the, the filing cabinets and they'd fall on you and we'd have to call in occupation, health and safety. <laughs> students were paid by bank draft that would be sent in the mail and they oh, could wow. easily go lost. Um, they'd fax in their results um, when they came in and I'd have to go in though during the holidays and refill the fax machines with paper because they'd all fallen on the ground. And so it was, to we were totally unprepared for the huge onslaught of um, applications that came that way. And for me, that was a highlight of not only get an introduction to international um, education, but learning to, to change processes and move with the time and be adaptive um, the long way. Mm. And that sort of brought me to my role now as sort of head of international recruitment at Deakin and I'm very fortunate to be working in a university that supports innovation and creative yeah. thought and um, I've built a, a really strong team both within Australia and overseas that's enabled um, Deakin to be well positioned mm. to, to recruit quality students. And how have you kind of seen, I guess, brand Australia kind of evolve over the course of, um, you know, those 25 years but also kind of you know, Deakin, you've obviously been at um, Deakin for a number of years, the kind of, the brands of the universities from Australia, has that really, has the strength of our brand really grown over the past kind of 25 years, as you mentioned, you've kind of a been, absolutely. been in the market? I, I know when I first started, you really had to sell Australia mm. because most international students were interested in going to the US or UK. They were seen as the destinations. Yeah. So universities and Australian government, um, it was Austrade and AEI back in those days, really had to promote the value of Australia, that it wasn't just quality education but it was a wonderful lifestyle and good job opportunities when, when you graduated. It, my very first job obviously was at the University of Melbourne and it had a strong brand. Yeah. Um, and I remember the first event I went to, it was in Singapore and I turned up and before I'd even put my banner up, there were hundreds of people queued oh, up. Oh, wow. Whereas my first event for Deakin was at the same event and I saw five people okay. over that time. So Deakin's had to work really hard to show how it is different and the unique opportunities that students can have. And now our numbers have, have just mm. really grown one of, in the top ten. Yeah, cool. And, um, you know, I mentioned kind of at the top of the conversation, obviously there's lots of change happening at the moment. Um, still a fair amount of uncertainty about how the changes will roll out with international caps and, um, you know, obviously the change in student numbers. How do you think um, this is going to kind of change how, you know, organisations like Deakin and other universities think about student recruitment, international student recruitment? And, um, yeah, how do you think they'll have to kind of adapt to these new changes? At the moment I feel like we're playing a sporting game but we don't fully understand the rules. Yeah. <laughs> So we're, we've already accepted students for trimester one, 2025, yep. and we're, we're recruiting more students at the moment, but we don't know what our caps are. Yeah. So you can't hold off because 
the government may not introduce the caps to 2026. Mm-hmm. That's our preference, yeah. if at all. Yeah. Um, so you've just got to keep on business as usual. And then I think once we know the caps, we can start to strategize yeah. because it may be that um, there's a preference for universities to recruit undergraduate students who are here for the full three years so yeah. you can maximise those financial returns from the student fees. So if that's the case, what happens with our T&E partnerships mm. where we get students who come with credit and are only with us for two years? Are they less of a priority than our three-year bachelor degrees? What happens to postgrad students who are here for one or two years? Mm. So it may change the way we think. Um, another way is some um, universities really use scholarships to div- diversify student cohorts. But will we have as many scholarships available if we've got less places? So mm. it'll be changing that strategy as well. Yeah, it's interesting you mentioned the T and E partnerships. I imagine um, for those universities who are kind of sitting in other countries who have really strong partnerships with um, you know universities here, it must be quite. Um, challenging to understand how this is going to kind of impact them, and and you know I know they that though they represent quite a large cohort of students that study here in Australia. So are you guys communicating a lot with them at the moment, or how's um, yeah how's how are those relationships um, navigating? I guess the, the kind of uncertainty at the moment. At the moment is business as usual yeah. because we don't have anything to go out, um, and Jason O'Clair has been. Uh, keep saying Australia needs to invest in offshore education and mm-hmm. he sees that as the way of the future. And so Deakin has invested recently in establishing two campuses offshore, one yeah. in Bangdung in Indonesia and one in um, India. So we'll be taking our first intake yeah, this well. month for India um, and then we'll do – Indonesia will be next year. So we are investing there mm-hmm. and then there's the more traditional um, T&E licensing articulation yeah. pathway. So we'll continue with those because they are very important for diversification, not in terms of – recruitment market but also into different courses as well yeah, your non-traditional bcom yeah. it those programs and with that um you know historically australia has been obviously a very attractive market for india and china's kind of been um you know a real focus for um for growth for universities you mentioned kind of obviously the campus in indonesia how, how else do you guys approach diversity and kind of attracting students from um you know other parts of the world i heard um, I saw some stats on LinkedIn. Someone posted about the, a huge spike in interest um, from a- America off the back of uh, the debate last week. So, yeah, how do you guys think about, I guess, yeah, diversity and attracting students from other markets? We've we've always had a strong focus on recruiting students globally and not being over reliant on two markets. Mm-hmm. So we have invested in a uh, very extensive offshore network. So we have students that are located across. Uh, Offices are located across um, the globe that can help us build government-to-government relationships, yep. partnerships and student recruitment. So that's one aspect of really building our diversity. Um, scholarships, as I said before, mm. and this is very common by other universities, you might have a Latin America scholarship or a Southeast Asia scholarship yeah. to try and grow those. And we, we also focusing not just on diversity by nationality, as I said before, but it's also diversity in the classroom for each course mm-hmm. and ensuring that you've got that gender mix as well. You don't want just all one gender yeah. in a particular course. So it's focusing on diversity on those three different pillars. Mm. And, um, you know, how have you kind of seen, particularly over the kind of last 10 years, obviously we've had COVID um, kind of in the middle, how have you kind of seen the role of the agent sort of evolve and change? And obviously there's such a critical part of the ecosystem and, um, you know, helping you guys, you know, reach more prospective students in other markets, I guess. How is kind of the role of the agent involved? And, and yeah, how do you guys think about agent engagement, I guess, in terms of, um, you know, in other, other countries? It's, the role of the agent has changed a lot since I've been in this industry. When I first started, information wasn't readily available on the internet. Yeah. I'm that old, I go back pre-internet. <laughs> and so the only way that in, prospective international students found out about study locations and universities was via, via word of mouth. Yeah. Um, it was through guides, course guides, and then through agents. So agents played a really critical role in not just selling a university but also Australia as a study destination. That has changed obviously now that students often go into an agent's office 
knowing which country they want to study in and knowing which university yeah. and attending to go in to just having their decisions confirmed by the agent that it's the right choice. Yeah. Now agents are playing a bigger role in ensuring that the students that they recommend do meet the Australian government's genuine student requirements. So doing those checks of bank drafts, checking the yeah. validity of resumes, checking academics. So they do a lot more of that quality assessment probably from before. But students want to work with agents. I know at a previous university I worked with, we did some research with a, a consortium of universities to look at could we accept students from Southeast Asia, so low-risk countries, directly into the university, encourage yeah. them not to use a third party? And the research showed the students wanted to use an agent. Essentially, they were too lazy. It was easy to just oh, okay. go into an agent I wonder office. if it, yeah, it was yeah. about the market and the nuance or, yeah. No, it was just ease that the agent would submit five applications on their behalf. Yeah, well, true. So I think there's always going to be a role, role yeah. for agents. The price of convenience. Yeah. <laughs> and um, yeah, it's kind of a nice segue, I suppose, into the next question. Um, knowing that you've had exposure and experience, um, you know, marketing to different markets throughout the world, what are some of the things, um, you know, that are really important when it comes to kind of reaching students in um, you know, international markets, particularly where, you know, English is second, third language. And how do you approach kind of the nuances that, um, you know, come with kind of reaching students in a particular region? I think that is where our offshore office comes to play mm -hmm. as well, because having local speakers in country who have, most of them have had experiences in international students, so they can really relate to, to their prospective students and their families. Mm -hmm. Because often it's the parents from those, those countries are most concerned about safety, about finances, um, is, are they going to get return on investment? So having those offshore staff is critical. We're just, and we're probably a late entrant to this, is using peer-to-peer ambassadors mm -hmm. as well so ensuring that students can relate to someone from their country and ask questions and get honest answers because prospective students are more interested in hearing from a fellow student Absolutely. than anything that I yeah. have to say um, so using that and then it's sort of understanding the various nuances of different cultures to ensure that the imagery that you use in marketing material and the language is appropriate for the target audience. Mm. Um, again, I, I remember we had a course guide that was sent out to across the globe and it had a girl with a rather low cut top on the front cover. And we told the marketing team that it's not going to make it through right. the Middle East. Yeah. And sure enough, they all came back as not meeting the, yeah. you know, the, decency act so it's being aware of, of what what will resonate in the market and be acceptable yeah. and I, ma I imagine it must be you know you mentioned the people in your team like getting the recruitment part of your own team and those markets must be just so critical to um you know running an effective international recruitment team how involved are you in kind of the recruitment of um, you know, your team kind of in these international markets, I'm sure you have kind of um, recruitment specialists within your team to, to recruit the right people. But, yeah, how do you kind of attract the right talent? We're very, I reckon we've got the best team at yeah. all universities. I might be Love a little it. bit biased. Um, <laughs> but it, it, it's hard to find the right people because not we're not only requiring on the students to recruit, uh, our agents to recruit students, but we also want them to be able to liaise with government because government, yep. government relations is really important. We want them to be able to work with alumni, get into schools and be welcomed as specialists. So it does take quite a bit of time to actually find the right people. In some markets we've used third parties to assist and others yep. it's through word of mouth. Mm. Um, but we have a very loyal team who've been as, with us for a long time. Um, so we do really acknowledge everything that they contribute to Deacon's success. Yeah, cool. Um, as we've kind of discussed throughout the conversation, there is lots of change kind of happening, um, you know, across the market at the moment. I guess, um, you know, there's policy changes, but also there's a whole bunch happening, um, you know, in terms of technology changes. Obviously, you know, the introduction of AI into the mainstream is, is um, you know, having a pretty large impact on how people think about education and you're starting to see it be more integrated into education. With kind of all that in mind and all the change going on, what do you see kind of when you look into the future of, uh, you know, international um, studies from an Australian perspective and how do you think things are going to change and evolve, um, you know, over, over the coming years? I think there's always going to be demand from international students to study in Australia because we do offer quality education and it's a great experience. Mm. 
we Deakin's been a leader on online study for you know up to forty years ago, okay. and that has been popular, and we're seeing that growing from our international students offshore. Not huge numbers, yeah, um, because most international students do want that in that experience in country, but we are noticing that there's the growth there. And also in terms of our partnerships where they can spend their first year studying their home country and then yep. coming because it's it's cost effective if they're young, the parents get to keep their children at home for longer. So they, they are growing. Mm. Um, so I think it's always going to demand, even with technology, for people to have that yep. actual experience in Australia. Mm. It's interesting. I had James from um, Insider Guides kind of sit down and have a conversation and, you know, they – deal with a ton of students that are studying here in, um, in Australia and he was like very similar in terms of really it's all about the experience and you know ultimately that's the main reason well the main reason that's one of the really key reasons people are coming to Australia yes they want to access amazing education yes they want community but that whole experience and connection and kind of um, you know living as an Australian uh, I think is like really important and obviously that but that fundamental is not going to change and go away. Absolutely. Terrific. Well, thank you so much for joining us today, Karen. Um, I've learned a few things. I definitely um, wasn't across. Have loved um, having you come sit down. If people want to find you, is LinkedIn kind of the best place yes. to reach out and have a conversation? Absolutely. Terrific. Well, thanks very much. Thank you for having me. Cool. Thanks. Cheers.